Hi everyone and welcome to the second, no the third now in this vision 2025 uh, We Make the Future webinar series. Uh, if you want to join in the conversation on socials, uh, you can do that using the Vision 2025 hashtag, the Creative Climate Action hashtag, at Event Vision 2025, at Julie's Bicycle, at CJ Consultant for Chris, and at Climate Live 2021. Uh, so my name is Chiara. If you haven't tuned into any of these before, I work at Judy's Bicycle and we're a charity that has spent the last 13 or so years uh, really empowering the music industry, performing arts, culture and wider creative community to take climate and ecological action. Uh, we bring people and networks together. We share and research what the issues are, uh, what works, co-create action and support new voices. Um, and along with Chris Johnson from Cambe Events and Shambhala Festival and Equilibrium and various other hats, um, we are founding members of the Outdoor Event Vision 2025 Community Pledge and Network. Uh, and our third guest today is also Francis Fox from Climate Live and one of the key organizing forces behind the School Strikes for Climate in the UK. And we're really pleased to have her with us. Um, just before we get going, a really quick opening poll to kind of take uh, the temperature, if I can find it, um, about where we're at and how people are feeling. So uh, current news headlines about the climate, how are they making you feel? More motivated and totally fired up for climate justice, uncertain, uh, don't really know what to think or a bit discouraged and in need of some community from everyone who's tuned in today. Great, so we'll share that. Um, it's brilliant to see how many of you are motivated and really, really fired up. And hopefully today is going to energize you even more and give you some places to put all of that energy. Um, for those of you who are a bit uncertain at the moment, Again, hopefully today is going to help you channel some of that confusion and hopefully clear some of it up and put you on a path to speaking out and taking action. And um, those of you who are discouraged and in need of some community, that's why we're here. Um, and hopefully by the end of the next hour, uh, you will feel less discouraged. Um, so just before we get going, um, we've just put out the results of our latest sort of uh, outdoor event industry green survey. Um, to summarize, one in three organizers have said their experience of this year has made environmental sustainability a higher priority, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty on people's minds, uh, concerns about the ongoing financial fallout uh, and the impact that's gonna have on our ability to take environmental action as events and also the impact of the pandemic on, on audience behavior. So whether it's gonna to lead to a, a rebound into private cars and people avoiding public transport and sort of sabotage a lot of efforts being made by events. Um, the priorities that are on people's minds are managing waste, energy use, carbon emissions, and also um, sort of jointly in third place is audience communications campaigns and engagement. So that's really what we're here to talk about today. The main driver for uh, environmental action for events is above all else um, for four and five of you, the internal commitment of the company staff or festival team. So a huge amount, I think, of personal energy and commitment is going into this work. Um, and uh, hopefully again, today is gonna give you some energy and courage to, to speak out about that. Uh, also, one in three events have said they want to create a new public engagement campaign on environment next year, and one in eight say they are going to have a new partnership with an environmental charity or campaigning organization next year. Um, and those are just the new ones, so that's not all the amazing partnerships that we know are in place already. Um, of course, what brings a lot of events together today is the, the Vision 2025 pledge. Um, around uh, about reducing environmental impact of events. Um, it was funny because as I was pulling today together, um, given today's theme, I think it's notable that we don't have anything in there that's really explicitly about speaking out. Um, and it might be time to change that um, because 
we do see those two things as really intimately linked um, and something that needs to change. Um, so this idea that cutting our impacts and helping our audiences um, cut their impacts is only one part, but it really takes on meaning when we push for change out there um, and put it into context of um, what needs to happen. And that's going to be even more important next year when the UK hosts the International Climate Talks, um, the UN COP Talks. Uh, and because the coming couple of years are really make or break years for climate action. So everything that we can do to push action, push momentum, push ambition, um, is it's this is the moment to do it, basically. And I think there is a lot of fear in actually the, the festival and events community sometimes. And it's it's actually silencing our creative voices in the most important conversation. Um, I think people aren't speaking out because there is some risk aversion. So this idea that we might alienate audiences, uh, a feeling that you don't want to put a downer on things. Um, and actually what we have seen is that this can be such an, an empowering, energizing and creative space um, if you approach it from that point of view of, of wanting to, to make a change. There's fear that we can only speak out when we're perfect. So, you know, you can only speak out if your event is the greenest ever. Uh, if I say something about what I'm doing, won't people just point out the things I'm not doing? Um, and I think to that, I'd say just coming back to this idea that this is not there is no end point to this. This is a journey that we are all on, um, actually as a whole civilization and this transformation that needs to happen. So this is a process. So if you're waiting until the moment that you're perfect, that moment is just never gonna come. And in the interim, that lack of confidence and that fear of saying the wrong thing means that we aren't getting heard at all. Um, and lastly, there is, there is sometimes also a feeling of isolation. So people feeling like you're outliers on the issue or like speaking out is gonna get you branded as a troublemaker or um, that you know no one else really cares. And I think within that, it's, it's useful to remember that actually four in five people in the UK are very concerned or fairly concerned about climate change. We do wanna get that to five in five, as in everyone. Um, and of course, you know, that concern is probably not yet translating into the level of action that we need or the political change that we need. And it does get a lot messier when we talk about next steps. But if you feel that fear creeping in, um, remember that generally speaking, four and five people are concerned alongside you. So you are not alone on this. Um, and I think the, the other thing that um, I find really useful when, when thinking about how we work on this um, is, uh, I guess what Brian Eno called it, a tropics of resistance at the Judy's Bicycle Conference earlier this year, um, and what we at JB like to call a creative climate movement. Um, that this is, this, there is so much that needs to shift, that this is really about all our voices coming together and finding their niche and their strength and the voice within your community and for the people who trust you. And if you look at how change happens and how movements work, there are so many different roles from the top down to the grassroots organizing. So what, what I've put up on this slide here is a, a social change grid um, by the Sheila McKechnie Foundation, just looking at where change happens and how it happens in all these different spheres from sort of the people working on the front lines through service provision and sort of changing uh, the very practical uh, bits of, of how services get delivered all the way to campaigning and, and activism in the public sphere to the stuff that happens on a more institutional level and lobbying and then also the, the amazing and huge role that community organizing um, plays. And so you know some of this also comes to, to understanding who you are because people listen to others who they hold in trust. So as a festival organizer or an outdoor event organizer, it's always worth asking that question of who holds you in trust and why? And therefore, how can you use that position and your power to raise up others, either by giving them space to speak out um, or by using your position to, to empower voices or push for change um, politically or otherwise? And I think we are seeing that happen in so many different ways in the festival and events community uh, from sort of the, the creative and the campaigning side from the festivals and events like 
Blue Dot is an obvious example of really putting science uh, center stage, including putting scientists on stage sort of alongside the headline acts to speak to people. And we're seeing it in the creative commissioning that outdoor events and festivals are doing, um, like Ariel Festival, who commissioned the Willow Herb Review, which is a publication um, celebrating diversity in nature writing and sort of raising up different voices in nature writing. Uh, and they commissioned a few pieces from those writers, again, sort of looking at our relationship to nature. Um, uh, Without Walls, which is an outdoor arts consortium, um, working together with Wild Rumpus, recently ran a sustainability creation lab, um, which included a three-day artist residency to really give space to some of the artists they were commissioning for creative work to engage with these themes of environment and climate change and how do we change our work. And hopefully from that create new creative opportunities that really explore some of these issues. On the campaigning side, um, one campaign that JB supported uh, was something called It's Our Time run by the comms lab, which was about mobilizing young people who care about climate to register to vote in the 2019 UK general election. And so through that, we worked within our networks, including some festivals who put out this messaging about getting registered to vote on their social media channels. Because again, it's sort of tapping into who are the audiences that we are speaking to and therefore how can we work with them to make change? Um, we're seeing more and more artists step forward and, and speak out. Um, this was a, a nice example from Reading last year. So Enter Shikari shared the so-called climate stripes, um, which is an image that was developed at Reading University, showing, um, uh, showing the warming of uh, our atmosphere through these sort of colored stripes. And they did a little speech to the audience kind of explaining what it was um, and, why they, um, and, and why they were displaying it. Uh, and then of course, as festival organizers, you can join and support different campaigns Again, little image there of the Festival Republic team going out to join the global climate strike last year. Um, and of course, I think a huge number of people who work in outdoor events and festival world have been really instrumental in, in helping make some of the Extinction Rebellion protests happen through equipment, through the skills that we have in the sector as well, and sort of putting those to work in support of these campaigns. And then, um, the other way I think that we are seeing so many of you step forward is, is in this idea of how you activate for action and also how you embody kind of some of the changes that we want to see out there in the world, whether that's the, the campaigns that the Association of Independent Festivals uh, have been running, uh, including Take Your Tent Home and Say No to Single Use, again, sort of highlighting some of these issues, um, drastic on plastic and pledging to eliminate single use plastics, um, We've seen other um, festivals like Festival Republic also do fan activation campaigns like the Zero Waste Festival Goer. Again, quite often getting people to pledge to do certain things and you know, putting in place incentives like having your pledge appear on the, the main stage video screen so you're speaking to others. Um, uh, we've seen sort of festivals take on this idea of you know, how can we very visibly become laboratories for the future? all the way back to Glastonbury in 2010, becoming or, or putting in place the biggest private solar power installation that there was at the time. And I think um, also experimenting with things like very visible renewable energy installations on the actual event site. So you start making these shifts visible. And of course, Chris, I'm not gonna say too much about it because you're here, but um, interventions like Shambhala's meat and fish free, um, going fully meat and fish free to start a conversation about um, what we eat, how it impacts the environment, and how we move forward from there. Um, and lastly, uh, a couple of things that are happening for sure next year. One is Music Declares Emergency is continuing with its No Music on a Dead Planet campaign. There will be more opportunities to get involved in that next year. And also Season for Change is a UK-wide cultural season on um, environment and climate change that will be running from February to May next year and we're encouraging as many artists and arts organizations to organize events or speak out about environment in that time um, and in January January there will be a website where you can sort of upload your events and of course climate live uh, and with that I'm going to hand over to Francis. 
Hi, um, thank you for everything you spoke about. It was really interesting, especially the facts um, about the survey from the festival industry. That's really good to hear. Um, so hi, I'm Francis. I'm 19. Um, I'm from Bath in England. I have just finished A-levels. I've been um, helping organise the school strike since they first started um, in February 2019. Um, and yeah, pretty much I'm on a gap year now. So my whole focus is climate activism. Um, so I first started organizing the strikes in Bath and Bristol, um, which went really, really well. We had um, 30,000 people in Bristol in February, which was incredible. Um, and my other role is with the UK Student Climate Network, um, which is like the national branch of the school strikes. Um, so my role there is festival coordinator. So I work to get us um, stalls at different festivals so that the youth strikers can talk to festival goers in a more chilled environment than like protesting on the streets about what we're doing and how people can get involved. Um, and yeah, it's gone really well. We had um, most notably a stall at Reading last year and um, we engaged so many people and um, just having those conversations in a relaxed environment with young people, it was really inspiring to see the, um, the widespread support that we have, um, that we have there. And yeah, uh, we'll be at a bunch more next year, including Glastonbury and Reading and Womad and Latitude. And if any of you guys fancy um, inviting some young people to talk about their campaigns, please do uh, get in touch. Um, Another thing I wanted to talk about is why um, me, for me personally, I've kind of dedicated my life to um, climate activism. Um, and that's because it's so shocking. Like it's only really come into the news over the past couple of years when Greta started speaking out. And for myself, and I know lots of my friends, um, it was a big, shock like why isn't this headline news why isn't everyone talking about this why did I not learn about this in school um it's honestly really shocking the lack of climate education uh, which is why we're doing a campaign called teach the future to um redo the education system to include um climate justice and you know what's happening and solutions to it because it's just not taught about enough um, as well as um education um, like a mandatory teacher training because um, teachers are, are asked questions often about about climate change and they don't know the answers which is which is very shocking because teachers are meant to teach children um, I digress um, so yeah the main kind of fight for me and motivation is working on Climate Alive, which I'll come to later, and on other Fridays for Future campaigns, um, which is like the international movement. Um, every day I speak to people who are on the front lines of the climate crisis, and they're so motivated and so determined. My friend, one of my best friends, Mitzi, is from the Philippines, and they recently had like three typhoons in a row. Her house was completely destroyed. She had to move and she's still fighting and she's still on Zoom calls and she's still doing activism and typhoon relief and international stuff as well. And my friend Jabaya from Bangladesh, his whole village has flooded. So he now has to get everywhere um, in, a, in a kayak. Um, and it's Stories like these, my friend Cal um, from, from Togo um, lives in the Sahel, so there's lots of desertification and she dedicates her life to planting trees and community projects. And it's like if people on the front lines who are facing those challenges every single day are fighting and, you know, motivated for climate action, then how can we not in such a privileged place and as, you know, global kind of causes of the climate crisis with colonialism and our emissions compared to the countries that are most affected we really need to step up and and do things and i feel kind of obligated to do that for those people who i am so fortunate and lucky to call my friends um 
yeah that's that's the the motivation for me um and yeah then going into uh climate life um so <laughs> um start it started last year um in spring um i thought you know there's so many young people that were not engaging in the climate movement like people at my school there's say like a thousand people at my school and maybe five to ten go to the climate strikes like in total there's a huge number of people we're engaging but if you look at the local level like there's so many more people that we can you know in, engage and people care but they just haven't kind of gone over to the to the action side as um Kiara was mentioning um so obviously everyone loves music so um I started messaging everyone on our like Fridays of Future many random group chats saying guys let's do concerts next year to engage more people and people were like yeah let's, let's do that um so now it's kind of all coming to fruition um over 40 countries um are planning concerts in April and October next year um the aims are to engage more people in the climate movement, educate them about um, the challenges faced by the people on the front lines and empower people to take action uh, with a focus on COP26 because the reason we're pushing for doing it in 2021 and you know going with April is because COP26 is so crucial with the renewal of the Paris Agreement pledges and um, we really, 2021 is such a key year. Um, so the youth climate activists have not stopped um, I feel like the best way to explain is to play our launch video, um, which explains things, saves you listening to me rambling, so I think Kiara can um, play that. Hello. Music has the power to unite people. It's the one universal language on the earth. We need to harness this power in one harmonious voice. 7.6 million took to the streets to demand climate action in September 2019. But leaders still fail to act with the necessary urgency. Millions of young people around the world are demanding change and it's time to stop the apathy on climate change. Can you hear us? Time is running out for the planet as we know it. So, to change everything, we need everyone. Youth climate activists supported by NGOs and music and events professionals are organising Climate Life. Concerts to harness the power of music. Following the model of school strikes, there'll be both events on large and small scales across the globe. Events are being planned in over 40 countries. We have three main aims. Engage a new audience to the climate movement. Educate more people about the challenges faced today by those on the front lines of ecological breakdown. Empower young people to pressure world leaders to take actions to combat the climate crisis. We are kicking things off all over the world with events on April 24, 2021. Followed by even more concerts on October 16th. For the UN COP26 climate conference next year, where governments will have to renew their Paris Agreement pledges. It is crucial for our future. That world leaders are more ambitious. Can you hear us yet? The climate crisis hasn't stopped for COVID and neither can we. The time is now. We can't do it alone. We need you. Please use your privilege and fight for us. It is so vitally important that anyone with a platform of any size does whatever they can to support the youth-led climate movement. Our generation dictates the future. This is the most important issue that we face. The louder we shout and the more we'll be heard. We only have one planet, we need to take care of it. We can make a difference. It's not too late to turn things around. Together, we need to be united in one voice. Make your voice counted too. Please join us. Come join us, man. Let's do this. Wow. Wow. So um, thank you so much for joining us, Francis. And uh, it, it, it feels so good to be uh, connected um, to what's what's really happening out there to be reminded of that and I've, I'm finding what you're doing with Climate Live and the whole youth movement completely inspiring and uh, the fact this has grown globally that it's just 
people doing it for themselves, that they're making it happen and, and managing to be heard uh, is so impressive. And I, the, the, even the, the tagline um, uh, for, for this campaign, Can You Hear Us Yet, is so powerful. So firstly, thank you for everything that you're doing. And I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, first question is, uh, for us as an audience of uh, event managers and events professionals in the UK, uh, can you share a little bit about the main principles or, or aims or decisions you've made about sustainability for your events? Yeah, definitely. And thank you. Um, so our main international um, sustainability policy um, is because we're, event, we're an event that's solely focused on, on the climate crisis. And we have events in 40 countries where um, saying no flying for artists or speakers to perform um, because there's just no need because there's events in lots of countries and because we're um, doing this specifically for the climate we're going to be spotlighted so we need to kind of up the game a little um, and this isn't me saying that um, you all need to not accept international acts to festivals um, because you know that's how festivals and touring and, and that's how it works currently um but yeah it's just something to to think about um in terms of, of travel of, of artists and making that as sustainable as possible um and our other policies um i speak for the uk event um things are different in different countries with access to renewable energy and you know veganism because some people live in fishing communities and those kind of things um so in the uk um we're planning for all the food to be vegan and vegetarian um obviously no plastic um we're encouraging people to travel by public transport um and we're working with local authorities to make that as accessible as possible and including that in our messaging so we've been speaking to various events people including Chris um, and a key thing is is getting the sustainability in the messaging of the festival um, so that's what we're massively focusing on um, yeah great so it's, a, a, it's quite interesting challenge for you thinking about uh, being a global movement and as you noted the the context for each of your events is very different but I guess the fundamental principles are the same um, in terms of guiding concepts um, and that um, around ethical sourcing and energy and travel. Um, is, is there enough that, that, that can be delivered uh, in all of the contexts to make those kind of principles clear? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean, sorry. Yeah, that was a badly phrased question. And I'm thinking about the, how interesting the challenge of running a global movement is uh, and, and how many different contexts there are. Uh, but how, e how easy has it been or is it for you to kind of uh, agree across the community and what the, what the fundamental principles are um, in terms of how you will manage events? Or is there quite a lot of conversation around that? Um, yeah, it hasn't been too uh, difficult in terms of values um, because basically it's being organised by the Fridays for Future youth climate groups that organised the strikes and then supported by NGOs like Greenpeace and Oxfam and some of the other. Um, but yeah, in terms of general kind of principles for sustainability and ethics, um, it's been fairly simple because young people across the world um, in the youth climate movement generally agree on these these things so it's not been too difficult and obviously we have had to say that it's flexible due to different situations in different countries um, and in terms of how we're organizing very much like the like the school strikes it's autonomous so any kind of youth climate group um, or climate group in general actually who would like to organize a concert can get in touch and start organizing and then we link them in with our like network um, internationally to stay in, contact but basically as long as it fits with our values people are, are free to to organize and we're not being you have to do this or this or this um in terms of event models and that kind of thing it's very flexible great and uh my final thought for the day is uh, what what can we do as the uh, the uk events industry to support climate live and your work Great question, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, yeah, so if there's any way you can help um, in terms of 
production or infrastructure, just offering advice, um, helping with reaching out to artists, um, literally any way you think you could possibly be helpful, please do send me an email. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. I'm more than happy um, to have a conversation, whether that's with me or another member of our team. Um, yeah, we can't do this alone as young people. Um, we're not festival organizers. Um, so we really are calling on the music industry, especially the more, um, you know, eco-leaning side of the music and events industry um, to help us um, young people make our voices heard and make Climate Live have a, have a real impact. Um, yeah. Great. And Francis, are you, do you know at this stage whether you're planning a live outdoor event or indoor event or online event for April? Um, so it depends on different countries with different COVID situations. So basically countries are choosing to either do something in April and October, do a big thing in April and a small thing in October, do a small thing in April and a big thing in October. Um, in the UK, we're doing um, like a live stream in April and then a in-person like big concert in um, October. Um, venue to be confirmed um, for that um, but yeah so in terms of April help things like if there's any kind of funky venues you think we could do the live stream from we've got a few options but if there's any others um, and then October things like production and kit and artists and the more um, usual kind of stuff. Great well is there anything else that you would like to say before we wrap up? um support support the youth climate movement. <laughs> it's, it's how it has to be like there's so many there's various like kind of ad, adult led um projects that have kind of we've spoken to them and they've kind of been doing their own thing and reluctant to kind of work with us and you know do stuff together you know the the youth voice is so powerful as is the um people in in places of power like um with events and the music and stuff so you know we're all calling for the same thing like let's work together um yeah. would be what i say well thank you so much for joining us francis thank you for your energy and leadership um thank you for doing the things that we didn't do as a generation uh when we're your age and um uh we we are with you and and uh, certainly uh, I think the Vision 2025 community in some way will be able to help and um, good luck on your journey and uh, I'll hand back to Kiara. Thank you. A huge thank you to, to Francis um, for joining us today. A huge thank you to all of you for listening in. But yeah, please do get in touch with Francis if you can support Climate Live. And um, remember that there are lots and lots of resources out there. Um, if you are feeling a bit lonely or a bit stranded, um, there's lots of resources on the on the Vision 2025 website, lots on the Jews Bicycle website, um, and also particularly when it comes to communicating on climate change, things like that. Um, for those of you who are based in the UK, um, Climate Outreach has just published an amazing bit of research, sort of looking at different audiences in the UK and how they respond to and feel uh, feel about different climate and environmental issues that can that can help you sort of identify I think uh, certain types of messaging and, and campaigns that might be really effective where you work. Great. Any final words from Chris or Francis? I I just really think that circular economy um, deserves to be seriously considered in everything that we do. I, th I think it's going to provide a common language. Um, for, for many businesses to access sustainability and for audiences to experience it. Uh, there's work to do there. It's not our common narrative as an events industry yet, but um, I think it's something we should consider and, and look out for. Uh, yeah, and, and, and also um, um, great, great to have been part today and thanks for having me. Brilliant, thank you all. And yeah, remember to speak out because you won't get hurt otherwise. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. It was great to speak.